All right, so I think we've all done this. We have looked up in the sky and we've looked at a cloud and we thought, hey, that kind of looks like something. In this case, that kind of looks like a hermit crab with the head of a rhinoceros. Why not? Well, that looks kind of like a bird or a pterodactyl. Or that looks like a blob with two other blobs. But that creature also looks like a blob with two other blobs. So our challenge here with assignment four is to use the skills we've learned in compositing that we most recently put together by making a creature and a landscape and then combining the two. And this time we're going to use those compositing skills using other people's pixels to interpret our own creature design as a cloud form that is suggestive of that creature design. So what do we need to do this? Well, we need a nice clean PNG cutout of our creature. So this is, was also our first step before bringing our creature into our landscape. But you might have made improvements to your creature. You might have a better silhouette cut out of it. How do we know it's a PNG? Well, it doesn't have any background around it. So if I view it, for instance, on its own, the background will change you can see it even with just the, the icon moving around. The background will change. It's not trapped into a, a white rectangle or any other kind of rectangle. And that's a PNG. Because we're, we're going to use this as a cookie cutter to shape our cloud. The next thing we need is a bunch of high resolution cloud reference. Because after we do a cookie cutter of our shape, then we'll build up with different tools to try to make that cloud more believable. So that's the goal. Now there are lots of different types of clouds. So what I'm going to do first for this assignment is make sure I have a PNG I can use for my creature design. So I go into my assignment folders, also nicely organized, and I'm going to go to assignment 2, my creature scape, and I'm going to look for my most finished PNG. And sure enough, there's one right here that I uploaded. And if I open it up in preview just by double clicking on a Mac, I'll see the gray background. And that shows me this is a very clean cutout. The problem is it also has this guy in it. So I can open it up and take that guy out because I don't want that as part of my cookie cutter. Or if you did it like I did it, you made another PNG for assignment three that you isolated because that's the the image that you brought into your assignment one landscape before you, you finished it off. So I'm going to use this PNG. I am going to move it to the desktop, but I'm also going to duplicate it onto the desktop. So this is a nice trick for a Mac. If I just click a drag and drop, it will take it out of this folder. But I want to leave it as an asset in this folder as well. And that's up to you. But if I want to drag and drop it while at the same time duplicating it, I hold down Option while I drag and drop. And you'll see the little plus sign next to the icon. And that means I can add it to the desktop. I'll add a duplicate of it to the desktop. So that's what I'm going to do. Then I'm going to go back to Assignment 4. And I need that PNG. And then I also need Cloud Reference. So I'm going to drag that to the desktop too. I've started it already. But let me show you how I got my cloud reference. So this is what you need to get started. A clean PNG cut out of your creature. And then high resolution cloud reference. 10 megapixels or bigger. There are lots of different types of clouds. We have these rolling storm clouds. We have puffy, beautiful cotton ball clouds. We have stringy, strange cauliflower-like clouds. <laughs> and you want to start collecting high-resolution images of ones that you think might help reflect your creature. Do be careful of the light source. Right? Clouds need to be lit in a certain way to be believable. And we are aiming for a believable image here. So just make sure your light source of your different reference is consistent. So how do you get high-res cloud reference? Well, I've gotten a lot of practice at this. We do a Google image search.
we can just search clouds, but then we want to make sure we limit our search options to larger than 10 megapixels, which is sad. I lose that rainbow one, which is so pretty. But without good enough resolution, they're not much use to us. And then, instead of just taking them from here, which would only steal the thumbnails, the very low-res thumbnails, I look at the ones I'm interested in. I like kind of the heaviness of these. I right-click and open them in a new tab. Oh, that's a nice vertical cloud. Those are hard to find. And by right-clicking and open, or uh, yeah, right-clicking and opening them in new tabs, I am able to check each one, viewing the image, seeing the quality of the pixels, pretty good. Then drag and drop them into my reference folder. Now, I mentioned that vertical clouds are unusual. Usually clouds are more horizontal than, than vertical. And my creature has some strong verticals in it. So this might be a very useful one. What do I mean about matching lighting? Well, clouds are almost always lit from the top, right? So they have shadows underneath them. And you can choose any lighting of your cloud you want, but you want it to be consistent across all the reference you use. Now this cloud, it feels more lit from the side Right? But there's also some heavy top lighting and a shadow underneath. Don't worry that the, the backgrounds are very different. We're going to be painting our own sky and replacing it. Sky replacement therapy on these clouds. Now, just in the Google image search, you can kind of see how this skill can be put to use. It's a very cheesy Valentine's Day way, but it works. So what we're doing is we're using available reference and we're creating using those pixels as our palette. It's kind of like our paint out of the tube. And then we'll be painting our own creature cloud out of that material. So this will be a little bit more subjective, a little bit more hands-on in terms of, instead of just collaging, we're also going to be building, but using uh, pixels as our texture. All right, let's get right to it. So now I've got that stuff. I've got a nice amount of cloud reference. And I've got my PNG cut out. So the first thing I want to do, let's see. There's that vertical cloud. The first thing I want to do is find one big cloud that I can roll out like dough. And I think this one will suit the bill. It doesn't really have that strong a light source, but it's very cloud-like. It's also a good um, exposure. So this isn't a photography class, but when you're using photo reference, you need to understand exposure. So if I look at, this is just within um, preview, but if I look at the histogram, which is this little diagram here of the red, green, and blue lights that are used to make up this image, I see that they're, they're mounted in the middle of the histogram, like mountain peaks. They are not spilling on the sides. And if they're spilling on the sides, it might look like this, where a lot of it is too bright and that information is blasted out. That makes it very difficult to use and doesn't make it look very believable. Or if it's spilling off the other side, it would mean that it's too dark in areas and then the shadows would actually lose information. So we're also looking for, for decent exposures, though of course we will expose them in our own ways using levels and color balance. So that cloud's gonna fit, fit the bill. So what am I gonna do? I'm actually going to open my PNG with Photoshop. And this is not the PNG after it was uh, shrunken to, put, to go into my landscape. This is the PNG that's full size from assignment two. So if I open it in Photoshop, I want to check its resolution and its size, but it should be 350 pixels per inch and a size that's suitable for printing between 8 by 10 inches and 13 by 19 inches, or possibly even a little bit beyond, just not below. All right, let's open that up. I will check the resolution using image, image size, and it will give me all of the parameters. So this image is 13 by 16 inches at 350 pixels per inch. That works great. It's bigger than I need. 
Now I'm going to bring onto it my one big mound of cloud, like a lump of dough. Okay. Now the nice thing about using clouds as reference is they are soft by nature. So there are not a lot of hard edges in clouds that are going to distort as we warp it or as we move it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stretch this cloud. And I'm just going to use scale. Just very simply stretch the cloud out. But notice I'm not holding down shift. I'm not locking its proportions. I am simply stretching it out like a, a piece of dough for my cookie cutter until I'm sure, and I can take the, um, the opacity down. I think this will work. Until I'm sure that my cookie cutter will be contained by it, right? Because I don't want to just cut part of the dough. I want to cut the whole image out. This is a, a new technique. This is still a smart object, notice. It has a little smart uh, layer in it. So if I tried to edit the cloud directly, it won't let me because it's a smart object. And I don't want to rasterize it. Instead, what I want to do is take my PNG layer, move it on top of my cloud layer. It's good positioning there. And then I want to use my magic wand. I can actually have contiguous unchecked for this because Photoshop is very good at selecting empty space. And if I have a nicely cut out PNG with a, just a default tolerance of 32 with contiguous unchecked and anti-alias checked, when I click, it will get all the nooks and crannies, all the empty spaces of my design, right? And even uh, reveal a few things that are barely visible, but that's okay. Now what I'm going to do, and this is what's a little new, is I'm going to move that selection to the layer underneath. So I turn off my creature layer, turn the eyeball off, and then I select the smart object layer. And so what do we have? Well, we have the little dancing ants showing me where the cutout is. Right? If I need to, I can select on the, uh, one of the marquee tools and I can actually move the selection around a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. So I'm going to move it a little bit to the right. And then I am going to say, I'm going to add to my selection since I moved it a little bit to the right. Make sure everything is selected. And now I want to invert my selection. Right? So instead of selecting everything that's outside of my creature, I want to select the shape inside the creature. So I say select inverse. And now I just have the cookie cutter shape. And now I just hit Command J to duplicate it onto its own layer. So it doesn't look like it did anything. But then if I turn my background cloud off, I have a cookie cutter of my creature. Cut out of cloud. And I can move it move it a little bit more towards the center. And now you can see it a little bit. It's offset with that cloud. Now I'm going to paint a sky for myself. So I make a new blank layer underneath my cookie cutter cloud. And very simply, I've already selected two blues here. One for the foreground that's darker. I'll make it a little bit more dramatic. One for the background that's lighter. And now I'm going to use a gradation tool. Straight linear gradient using the foreground and background colors that I've selected on a new layer behind my cloud cutout. And I get to pick the angle with which I paint that gradation. So that's just a sky for me to start with and to get a sense. So does this look like a cloud? The interior does. But all these sharp edges, no, that definitely does not say cloud. But it gives me a, the background structure to get started. OK, so that's our first step. Now I'll start building other cloud references on top and placing them in. 
just like we've done in past compositing projects.